und herzlich willkommen. Greetings to all listeners and welcome to the first episode of this new season of The New Germany. This special series is part of our History and Politics podcast, which explores the interplay between history and modern day politics. My name is Gabriel Voidelko and I'd like to warmly welcome our two hosts, Katja Hoyer and Oliver Moody, who will be guiding you through the intellectual tapestry of our past and present times. We start this new series of the new Germany with a distinguished guest. Peter Altmaier is with us, a long-standing politician, a former minister who has held many important political functions in the different governments under German Chancellor Angela Merkel. With Katja Hoyer and Oliver Moody at the helm, we will delve into an in-depth analysis of Germany's past and present challenges. Unfortunately, there is some noise in the recording that we were unable to edit out, for which we apologize very much. Thank you for your understanding. And now, over to you, Katja and Oliver, ready to embark on a journey of insight with Peter Altmaier. Hello and welcome back to The New Germany, a special series for the Kerber Stiftung's History and Politics podcast – looking up what Germany's past can tell us about its present and its future. Those of you who have been listening to us for the first two seasons will know that up to now we've been trying to decipher the Zeitenwende, the dawn of a new era, declared by the Chancellor Olaf Scholz three days after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine last year. But now, nearly two years down the line, the stakes of the game have changed. The right-wing alternative for Germany party, or AFD, is polling at more than 20% of the vote and has built a commanding lead in the running for three crucial East German state elections that will be held in the autumn. The government's own economic advisers have warned that the country's growth prospects are at their lowest level on record and the pension system is in danger of heading for meltdown. One in three of Germany's biggest companies are making preparations to shift production elsewhere, spooked by eye-watering energy bills and the broader costs of doing business in their homeland. Economists also claim that the country needs to attract as many as 1.5 million foreign workers a year to have a hope, or any hope really, of, of sustaining its prosperity. But at the same time, Scholz has announced a new German hardness towards asylum seekers as their numbers approach levels last seen in the 2015 migration crisis. The polls paint a picture of a nation wracked by concerns and internal conflicts about immigration and integration, energy and climate change, inflation, social justice and the future of the economy. Only 27% of German voters now trust the state to do its job well. 69% say it's overwhelmed. So, against this backdrop of broad-spectrum pessimism and uncertainty, the term Zeitenwender no longer feels, feels entirely adequate. What we're really talking about here is a stormy transformation at every level of society with little sense of where things are going or how they might conceivably turn out to be better than before. At the end of each year since 1949, the Allensbach Polling Institute has asked Germans whether they look forward to the 12 months ahead with more hope or fear. And the last time the level of hope was this low was in 1950. This is a national crisis of identity and faith with bells on. <laughs> well, that was cheerful. I, th I feel like we need a lie down and a hell is already a stormy transformation at every level of society. You make me sound so Churchillian there. I'm, I'm quite flattered. <laughs> Do you think we overdid it a bit? It did all sound like the um, a start of an Asterix comic didn't it? These one small village of indomitable Brandenburgers still holds out against the invaders. <laughs> All right, Bjorn Höcke. Anyway, that Cassandra over there is Oliver Moody, a British journalist based in Berlin. And those strident Prussian tones belong to Katja Hoyer, a German-British historian now living in uh, Norfolk? Yeah, <laughs> Norfolk. And why not? You sound surprised. Well, how, how, would you, how would you describe Norfolk for our, our sizable contingent of German listeners? Well, I sort of rather suspect if I if I was uh, inclined to make Freudian analyses of my own um, psyche that I probably replicated the situation I lived in in Germany where 
the sort of flat, uh, wide landscapes of Brandenburg being just outside of Berlin was kind of my environment. And now I live in uh, flat, wide landscapes not far from London. Um, and that seems to be um, seems to be the theme here. So, yeah, very rural, lots of sheep, um, lots of walking, pubs. Um, it's it's a nice place to be um, and not not too far out. People are always a bit surprised when I say that I live in Norfolk and, you know, you're somewhere in London, but actually it isn't it isn't a world away. Yeah. Good potato country. Um, that I too. <laughs> believe your your local MP is now one Elizabeth Truss, who might be able to tell you a thing or two about leadership in a time of crisis. I was delighted to find that out myself. Um, but yes, uh, that's... Yeah, I'm not not quite sure what to make of that yet. Whether the comedy factor is bigger than the despair, um, but we'll <laughs> we'll see where that's going after the next election. All right, back to Germany. This does feel like an unusually propitious moment to be doing a history flavored podcast, because if you read about what the country's been through over the past eight decades or so, it's really startling how many of the things we mentioned at the start of this episode are not really new. No, that is that is true, and it often maybe it's it's me as a historian thinking that way. But I'm often surprised how often people think, you know, that they're, they're onto a new problem or something that has never happened before. You know, the word unprecedented is used a lot in the media. Um, most of us historians sit there and go, no, not unprecedented at all. This did happen at some point <laughs> in history before. Um, I think quite often we're we're reluctant almost to look at historical examples when actually, you know, they they are quite revealing in terms of not just the problems that have presented themselves before, um, but also the way that people responded to them. Um, I think it was Mark Twain who said history doesn't repeat, um, but it often rhymes. <laughs> and I think that's uh, a good sort of adage to go by. There's a lot to be learned from history, even without, you know, directly sort of taking examples and, and uh, using them as a as a one-to-one -one kind of case. Um, but there is a lot of, you know, patterns and, and trends that have obviously um, been the case before, particularly with the problems that we're now facing, things like, uh, you know, inflation, political extremism, upheaval, all of those things aren't aren't new, of course. Mark Twain also had a lot of things to say about Germany, but um, that's probably a subject for another episode. Um, <laughs> what, we're, what we're going to do here in this season is take a look at seven aspects of Germany's present metamorphosis from industry and social change to political extremism and relations with its closest allies and ask from a historical perspective, how deep is the crisis really? Where did it come from and how might you get out of it? And we are going to start today with the role of the Chancellor. Yeah, and before we go through our roster of four crisis chancellors, though, I think we um, it might be a good idea to ask what a crisis actually really is and uh, who gets to define it. Yeah. Um, if you're in journalism and you're, you're lucky, you will have an editor who pushes back a bit whenever you get the urge to describe something as a crisis. Because we, we do have an unfortunate tendency to, to catastrophize a bit. And um, crucially, a crisis does come with its own internal logic of uh, an imperative for immediate and decisive action, action this day, as, as Churchill would have put it, which is sometimes the detriment of actual strategic thinking or concentrating on other problems. And I think a sceptical approach is, is particularly important at a time when there is a general sense that we're living in a polycrisis, a kind of pileup of multiple global comorbidities that overlap and make each other worse. Because the danger here is that you tip over into a condition of permacrisis, where politics is constantly twitching on edge and lurching from one drastic bad decision to the next. And I think the, um, the current palaver over asylum seekers in Germany is quite a good example of that. Because at the time we are recording this episode, it looks very much as though Germany is going to have registered more than 300,000 first-time asylum applications by the end of 2023, which would be the highest number since the peak in 2015-2016. And that's coming on top of the best part of a million war refugees from Ukraine. And a lot of German voters are obviously very worried about this, and pressure is built up on the state and federal governments to find some kind of dramatic and easy-sounding solution, like putting a cap on the number of people who can apply for asylum or setting up an offshore asylum processing centre somewhere like Libya or Egypt or Lebanon. And 
I think it's to Olaf Scholz's credit here that he has resisted the temptation to call it a crisis, because this issue is not only exceedingly difficult to solve, but also pretty likely to be with us for years to come. And so you have Scholz uh, acknowledging the public concern and coining the phrase new German hardness for how he intends to deal with it. But at the same time, his kind of central metaphor for immigration controls is as a kind of very complicated machine with hundreds of these tiny screws, each of which looks a bit insignificant on its own. But if you turn enough of them the right way, you'll make a difference. Now, is this avoidance of melodrama clever electoral politics? I mean, time will tell. But is it a reasonably honest and responsible way to deal with a very complicated and long-term problem without catastrophizing it into a crisis? I think you can make that case. So, catch it. Who is the first crisis chancellor you brought along to this show and tell? It's also somebody who um, approached um, a, a sort of, you know, moment in time that many felt was a, a moment of multiple crises all happening at the same time, an existential moment really for Germany with a fair degree of calm and a, a sort of can-do attitude and, a, and you know, a kind of willingness to try and um, solve the, the problems really rather than, you know, approaching them with a um, with an ideological mindset. And I'm talking about Gustav Stresemann, who is arguably maybe, you know, the uh, kind of crisis chancellor, if you will, because the the nation really did genuinely um, experience a moment of crisis at that point that I don't think can be can be talked away as something um, sort of insignificant or something that wasn't uh, as bad as it sounded. It really was was bad when he became the chancellor. So the moment um, that that happened was the thirteenth of August, nineteen twenty three, um, when Germany really was on the or the German democracy anyway was certainly on a on on the brink. So, you know, before him no fewer than seven other people had occupied this office at the, of the Chancellor Chancellery since nineteen nineteen. Um, and they'd all failed to maintain the confidence of what was by then a, a very raucous and splintered parliament. Uh, Stresemont. You almost make it sound like Britain. <laughs> yeah, or several other countries that I can think of at this at this present moment in time. Yes, so Stresemann was really trying to deal with um, a number of different sort of strands of, of ideologies that were all represented in Parliament at the t same time. Um, he was trying to hold together a coalition of five different parties, all trying to deal with um, sort of Germany's existential problems. So, for example, at the time, French and Belgian troops had just occupied the Ruhr region um, because they were protesting against uh, Germany's failure to pay uh, reparations for the First World War. Um, unemployment had risen to over 4 million. Um, and in November, Adolf Hitler had also attempted to seize, um, or will at this point, attempting, he will be attempting to seize power in the so called Munich Putsch. So all of these things kind of added to not just a sense of crisis, but a genuine kind of existential crisis that, that the state was in at this point. Um, on top of that, Germany was in deep economic trouble. So you had um, hyperinflation going on. So just to give you one example here, in, in November 1923, one kilogram of beef cost 4,800 billion marks. Um, so this this is easily one of the worst crises, I would say, that Germany um, ever faced. Um, in fact, when uh, he was asked to take over the, the leadership, um, by the way, the SPD was the largest party in this um, coalition, but they didn't want the chancellorship at this point. Uh, considering considering it very much a, a sort of poison chalice. Um, Stresemann actually wrote to his wife and said that taking this office was akin to political suicide. <laughs> um, but somehow he still managed to to look at all these different crises and, and sort of ride out the immediate storm anyway. So, you know, against immense pressure and resistance from both the left and the right, um, he called off the anti-French strikes in the Ruhr, introduced an emergency currency uh, to stabilise the economy, and actually began talking to France, Britain and the US um, about a kind of way out of the, the crisis that the reparations um, payments have caused. Um, so even though his government was actually brought down um, in November of the same year, so he wasn't actually chancellor for, for very long, um, he did carry on the same work um, that he'd begun as, as foreign minister, which was a position that he held up until his death in, in 1929. 
So I suppose I'm cheating a little bit in that a lot of the Stresemann achievements actually came um, after he was no longer chancellor. But it was still a he was still an amazing um, problem solver in that he sort of stabilized most of the uh, immediate problems that that Germany faced. Faced. Um, I think some of the lessons here in in terms of what we can can learn from that isn't so much the kind of specific problems that Germany was facing at that time, as they are, of course, very peculiar to the to the to the nineteen twenties. Um, but I think uh, the lessons to be learned from Stresemann are that um, he was following his own instincts. He was criticised very very heavily from the left and the right. Um, in terms of what he was trying to do, and followed his own very considerable political acumen to try and find a way uh, through. So almost detached from the kind of you know big ideological strands at the time, should Germany stick to the uh, Treaty of Versailles or not, those kinds of things, he found um, a way through that was pragmatic rather than based on kind of previous thinking. And I think in that respect, um, he did manage to to get Germany through that immediate spell of, of crisis. Although it's hard to tell, of course, whether in the long run that would have been successful. He actually died on the 3rd of October 1929, which was only 26 days before the Wall Street crash plunged Germany into its ultimate uh, darkness, of course, and into the fall of the of the Weimar Republic. So who knows whether he would have been able to save Germany from, from its ultimate uh, fate at that point. Um, so who's your first pick? How can you how can you beat that? Well, I don't know if I can beat that, but um, let's fast forward nearly fifty years and look at how Willy Brandt, the first social democratic chancellor of West Germany, dealt with the nineteen seventy three oil crisis. Pretty much slap bang on fifty years ago, on the day that we're recording this. Because I think it's not only very relevant for today, but has also been described by some historians as the first true crisis of globalization. So if we set the scene, it is at this point October 1973, and 12 months earlier, Brandt has been re-elected after an epic campaign in the Bundestag election. In about 18, eight months' time, uh, he's going to resign after one of his closest aides, Gunter Guillaume, is outed as a spy for East Germany. And all of a sudden, a coalition of Arab countries led by Egypt and Syria launches a surprise attack on Israel, starting the Yom Kippur War, which catastrophically backfires from a military perspective. And so in an effort to pressure the West out of its support for Israel, the OPEC states cut their oil production. The price of a barrel of oil nearly doubles in a single stroke, and it's quadrupled by the end of the year. And this hammers a lot of Western countries, but it triggers a full-fat, bona fide crisis in West Germany, which at this time is dependent on OPEC for about three quarters of its oil imports. And oil in turn makes up more than half of West Germany's primary energy consumption. So the bill goes up by 150% in a matter of weeks. And I know Brandt is widely revered in Germany today and sometimes tops the polls of the best chances in the history of the Federal Republic. But... If I had to pick an image to sum up how he responded to the crisis, it would be a man stuck in a nightmare where there is a gigantic meltdown going on in the factory and he's pulling all of the levers in the control room and they just keep snapping off in his hands. Um, so I think a lot of the examples you can learn from this are, are actually negative ones. So in the very early days of the upheaval, uh, Brunt tells the Bundestag, um, the crisis at whose beginning we stand is not to be trivialised. The younger generation is experiencing for the first time what a certain shortage can mean. And so his primary response there, pretty much just as Schultz and, and Harbeck's has been in 2022, is to try and push sacrifice and energy conservation as an opportunity, a so-called sort of sixth source of energy. So you get a driving ban on these so-called car-free Sundays once a month, which a lot of Germans just ignore. And they turn out to be so radically unpopular, there are only four of them in the end. Uh, you get a blanket, 100 kilometer an hour speed limit on the autobahns, which again is abandoned after six months. Um, and aside from some of the kind of economic stabilization measures, such as short time work, none of it really does anything. And Brent's appeals for self-sacrifice go down like a cup of cold sick with the public. You have both the FRZ and BUILD newspapers comparing them to the Nazi era propaganda campaigns trying to get households to make rudimentary Sunday stews to save on exports. 
And ironically enough, this is also the period in West German history where having a shower or a bath every day becomes normalised. Something about this appeal for, for giving up energy use actually kind of resulting in people enjoying using more of it. At the same time, Brandt announced that West Germany won't be taking in any more Gastarbeiter or foreign guest workers because of rising domestic unemployment. This is not only terrible economics, because at that point, the average Gastarbeiter contributes 10 times more to the state in taxes than they receive in benefits, but it's also a complete failure on its own terms, because the number of Turks living in West Germany actually goes up over the following decade from 900,000 to 1.5 million. Because these guest workers are deciding that instead of going home and risking not being able to get back into Germany, they might as well settle down and bring their families over. And that in turn increases the drain on state resources. So broadly, I think Brand's response to the oil crisis is a story of panicked half measures that were too drastic and not properly pitched to the public. What you do also have is some very interesting long-term consequences because the way that West Germany tries to get out of its oil dependence on the Arab states at the time is, of course, by buying more oil from the Soviet Union. I mean, mm. good luck with that one, guys. <laughs> and on the other hand, though, the, the positive upshot is that it does usher in this age of rigorous energy efficiency standards for housing and household gadgets that seem completely normal now and a short-lived renaissance of atomic energy. So it wasn't an unmitigated disaster, but I think it is certainly a study in how not to manage a polycrisis. Who's next? Yeah, also, I mean, many many of the um, problems seem so modern in lots of ways as well. You know, the, the, the way that we are currently, again, thinking about how to save energy, preserve energy, for example, you know, the way that people were asked to uh, sort of, you know, consider when and how um, to heat their, their homes and, and, and to what temperature, the fact that public buildings were switched off, you know, at night, the, the lightings on them and things like that is, is quite um, remarkable because I think it was the same sort of thing that lots of people got quite frustrated about is this, this kind of idea of state interference in the in the private sphere. Um, so, yes, many lessons to be learned from that more in, in how not to do things, I guess. I should say what's, what's, what's interesting about the way that Schultz and Harbeck dealt with it is that there wasn't an equivalent really to Brandt's speech to the Bundestag telling young people that they didn't know how good they'd had it and that they were all sort of soft weaklings who needed to learn the value of self-denial. Um, they used primarily economic incentives to to kind of nudge people into cutting their their energy use. And, and I think that is one of the ways in which Germany has actually learned from the mistakes of, of history. Anyway, let's get on to our next crisis chancellor. Sure. Um, it is actually the next crisis chancellor. We're talking about Helmut Schmidt here, the successor to uh, Brandt, who was still very much dealing with, with the same issues. Um, I did choose him nonetheless because I think in contrast to um, Brandt, he's he's kind of the prototype of of the pragmatist, if you will, somebody who comes to crisis management with um, a sort of you know cold, calculating mind, far away from from emotionality or or ideology, or at least that's how he presented himself in, in public. He famously once said that he who has visions should go and see a doctor. <laughs> Kind of with the idea being, you know, you look kind of for problems uh, to solve and how to solve them rather than um, kind of painting a big, uh, diffuse sort of vision of, of what you're trying to achieve. Um, so there are some interesting lessons, I think, in that, given how um, difficult it is for politicians today to navigate the the treacherous waters of the culture wars. Um, you know, and, and Schmidt basically kind of dismissed all of the ideologies that were there at the time and and tried to largely deal with with problems as he saw them. Um, so, you know, we mentioned in the oil crises, uh, for example, to start with, which uh, Brandt had, had had a very mixed um, uh, sort of success rate with. Um, Schmidt's response to that was to rigorously cut down on social welfare, for example, and thin down the, the state and basically try and save money that way, which of course leads them very, very far away from from the SPD's kind of core trajectory. And therefore he was um, you know, faced with with vicious criticism from his own party for this. Um and nonetheless, he tried to stick to the kind of whole idea of the welfare state. So he was still calling it Europe's greatest achievements uh, of the 20th century, but did uh, sort of cut down on individual measures in the hope that that would uh, kind of relieve the financial problems on the 
on the state is something that we see SPD chancellors, for example, Gerhard Schröder do again later on. And is of course, is still um, a huge debate today as to, in terms of what the state can afford, um, you know, in terms of um, handouts and benefits. Um, the oil crisis also, as you just mentioned, highlighted another problem um, that seems very familiar today um, in terms of energy. And as you say, it made Germany more reliant on on cheap um, fossil fuels from, from Russia. And Schmidt's answer to this was actually a different one, namely nuclear energy. He looked at this and, and was again faced with huge criticism from his own party and, and from that side of politics and argued that, um, and I quote, I find this astonishing that among the great industrial states of the world, from, from the US to China, Japan and Russia, the Germans are the only ones who believe that they can cope without nuclear energy. And it's once again a question that hasn't really gone away. Many states are now looking to nuclear energy again as a means of you know, independent energy production that, that can be um, comparatively uh, environmentally friendly, at least what in, in terms of um, emissions, as, as far as emissions are concerned. And it is a question that wasn't solved then and it's not going to be solved now. Um, but it is interesting that he was willing to move so far away from his own, you know, field to try and pursue a way that, that would have led to greater energy um, independence for for Germany. Um, and then, of course, the biggest threat that, uh, or the biggest uh, crisis on a political level that Schmidt faced during his tenure, and perhaps the thing that defined it, uh, was far left terrorism um, from the so called Red Army faction, uh, who were responsible for the murder of over 30 people and then tried to get some of their own people out of prison by blackmailing the government uh, into releasing them uh, through captured. Um, or kidnapping people, basically, and, and taking them hostage. And Schmidt's response to this was a very, very hardline, uncompromising stance, um, which risked, obviously, the, the lives of the hostages. Uh, but in the end, I think, did actually bring this whole thing to an end because there was literally no point in in negotiating with the government over this if, if the government says we're not negotiating with with terrorists. Um, that's, again, something, of course, not quite as, as severe today, but it is still a a thing that the government has to consider when it comes to things, for example, like, um, you know, climate activists. Um, it's, it's not the same, of course, as kidnapping people, but they do often, of course, break the law or damage property and things like that. And the government has to find a way of of responding to these um, things as well. And it's the same also in, in many ways in that the Red Army faction also enjoyed some sympathy uh, from the public as well, not from everybody, not from the majority, but there were people kind of vaguely sympathetic towards their cause, um, especially again on on Schmidt's side of the political spectrum, um, and he faced a lot of criticism for that. Um, and also, lastly, in terms of security, that was another um, big crisis that um, Germany faced at the time, looking at the fact that the Soviet Union was stationing more missiles um, in Europe. And uh, it was actually Schmidt who pushed for the uh, so-called NATO double-track decision in, in 1979, which basically meant that more um, medium-range nuclear missiles were stationed in Germany um, by the US. And uh, the result of, of this was basically that you had the largest or some of the largest demonstrations in Germany ever emerging out of this and also the emergence of the Green Party as a sort of pacifist uh, response to to all of that. So it's very interesting. He's another example of somebody who kind of had his own ideas, was his, um, had his own mind on certain things and was trying to solve the crises of the day, you know, basically following his own political instincts as opposed to, to those of his party or those of the advisors around him. There's an obvious question here, right? Which is that while all this is happening in Schmidt's native Hamburg, there's a young law student and rising star in the local youth wing of the SPD called Olaf Scholz, who is a long way to the left of Schmidt on a, on a lot of issues, especially on NATO. Mm -hmm. And obviously Scholz has come some way back towards the centre since, since, since those days. How much do you get the sense that, that, Schmidt, that Scholz has sort of studied the leadership st style of Schmidt and learned from it? It is an interesting question, given that, you know, this was at the same time as Scholz called NATO an, an imperialist uh, venture, you know, and, and was sort of very, very critical of that stance. Um, and, 
you know the the deputy leader I think of the of the young socialists as well so the youth movement of the or the youth wing of the SPD um so at the time I doubt that there was much studying of uh, Schmidt going on if anything um it was probably more to uh, to see you know how how to pull the SPD back into the into the onto the left hand side of the political spectrum um I'm not sure entirely. I mean, Schmidt is obviously hugely revered in Hamburg itself um, and also often ranks among the more popular of Germany's post-war chancellors. But at the same time, um, I think there was even at the time a lot of criticism of this kind of very stubborn you know, thing that he did, kind of sticking to his own ideas and, and pushing them through. So I'm not entirely sure that this is, is Schultz's style as well. I mean, I know at, at times he comes across as you know, very aloof and kind of making up his own mind before he even speaks to anybody else. But I think that's a different thing from from Schmidt, who often came across as kind of in public as very vocal as well, which um, is less so the case with Schmidt, who, uh, with Charles, who comes across as more, you know, sort of reserved and, and holding back almost. What do you think? I have to admit, I have cheated a bit on our fourth and final chancellor. We are inevitably going to discuss Angela Merkel, the crisis chancellor par excellence. But instead of foisting my own half-baked theories on the listeners, I'm going to bring in an expert witness who knows the ins and the outs of those years better than almost anybody else on the planet. Is it Richard David Precht? (laughs) (laughs) No, I think we could do a bit better than that. Today's guest will be a familiar figure to many of our listeners. Peter Altmaier grew up in a working class family in the Saarland a small but politically distinguished Bundesland on Germany's border with France, and studied jurisprudence at its state university. He initially worked as a senior official in the European Commission, and then in 1994, he was elected to the Bundestag for the CDU, rising to become chief whip in 2009, then federal environment minister in 2012, succeeding Norbert Röttgen, whom we spoke to about Germany and China in the last season of this podcast. 18 months later, Herr Altmaier was promoted to lead Angela Merkel's chancellery, overseeing the machinery of government and contacts with some of the most powerful figures in the world during the latter stages of the Eurozone crisis, the first Russian invasion of Ukraine, the European migration crisis of 2015 and 2016, and the Brexit referendum. From 2017 to 2021, he was subsequently the Federal Minister for Economics and Energy, introducing Germany's first industrial strategy and working on the response to the COVID crisis. Herr Altmaier is also an enthusiastic student of history and has one of the most beautiful collections of antiquarian books I have ever seen outside an institutional library. Herr Altmaier, welcome to the New Germany. Morning. Herr Altmaier, you and Angela Merkel have both read a great deal of history. Against this background, how much did you have a sense of dealing with an exceptional period of overlapping crises during your time as Chancellery Minister and Economics Minister? And what specific lessons did you and the Chancellor draw from these historical precedents? Certainly, during my period as a minister in the Chancellor's office, I certainly felt this uh, sense of historic um, uh, imminence and uh, importance. Uh, But from a purely historical perspective, um, it was not so much different from the past. Remember the Nap- Napoleonic Wars, the, the foundation of the German Empire in 1870, the First and the Second World War, the threat uh, coming from um, Adolf Hitler and uh, his regime uh, from Germany uh, to other neighboring countries in Europe and uh, across the world. And even uh, during the uh, post-war period, between 1950 and 1990, there have been numerous crises around the world. Nevertheless, I think that something has changed over the last 30 years, and that is exactly that after the um, end of the Cold War, we have seen also an end of the um, bipolar world order after the Second World War. Uh, The U.S. and uh, former Soviet Union as two strong opponents, but also partners, uh, dealing with each other and uh, China, that is uh, part of the past, it is part of history. And when you look at the events, the evolution of politics um, since the end of the Cold War, I think you can um, identify three main uh, structures. One is um, we have um, less unilateral leadership than before. Our American allies um, 
from time to time seem to be a little bit tired, uh, leading the world, policing the world. Um, but the European, the Europeans were not uh, in a position to fill the gap uh, that was left by our American friends. The Soviet Union disappeared and it um, has opened uh, new perspectives for many countries around Soviet Union, inside Soviet Union. But at the same time, Russia went from a, a country looking for more democratic structure, slightly but steadily, to a country with authoritarian uh, regime um, and uh, threatening um, again its neighbors. And we have seen um, since 9-11, um, a new situation in so far that the crisis has become the new normal. It's not an exceptional situation, but the fact that uh, we are all living in a globalized world, that we have seen an enormous increase of international trade, that most of the problems we are facing from climate change to COVID-19 have a, a global scale. That means that we are in a permanent uh, modus of crisis, not just in Germany, but also in the US, in the UK, in France, and uh, other countries uh, worldwide. And um, we have to adapt to a situation where crisis never ends and where you have to handle multiple crises at a time. Uh, for example, the refugee crisis and the second euro crisis in 2015. Uh, for example, now the days the um, Russian war of aggression against Ukraine and the terrorist attack of Hamas against Israel at a time, I could add more examples um, to that. And as someone with a historical mind who clearly looks back all the way to the 19th century and, and the 20th century for kind of historical answers to problems, do you have a, a kind of favorite model, somebody that you look to? Is there a, a chancellor in German history who you think was best at managing crises? This question, I believe, as a humble former politician, has to be answered by history and uh, historians. But if you look back to our first uh, democratic uh, post-war chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, he was on the one side in a much better position because Germany was not a global uh, actor at that time. It had even not uh, a full degree of sovereignty. But Adenauer was challenged by the enormous task to establish the first working and lasting democracy in Germany. And then um, after 9-11, of course, we had um, numerous uh, military conflicts. Uh, may I recall you the um, American war in Iraq? May I recall you the uh, NATO action in um, against Libya and its uh, dictator Gaddafi. May I recall the refugee crisis I have, I've already mentioned. And this is uh, because it is a, um, a typical, a typical um, uh, phenomenon after the end of the Cold War. It has no precedent in modern history. Uh, and therefore, it is so difficult uh, to compare. But what I can say is that um, Angela Merkel's role has to be seen against the background uh, of our close friendship and cooperation with countries uh, like uh, France, United Kingdom, and the U.S. Uh, Germany has always uh, tried being part of the solution, not of the problem. That was not always uh, easy. Uh, and as you can see, uh, when the uh, government resigned and was replaced by the new and uh, ample coalition, still some problems were left and uh, not yet resolved. During that long decade, when you worked closely with Angela Merkel at the apex of the German state, which of the crises, or it might be better to say, which of these periods of overlapping crisis did you find the most difficult and why? It may be a surprise to you, uh, but looking back, the most difficult certainly was and is um, the fight against the climate change. Why is it the case? Because we identified already in the 90s when Angela Merkel uh, brokered um, with others the uh, Kyoto um, uh, the Kyoto Agreement, um, then, um, uh, then we realized the urgency of joint action. We have done and achieved quite a lot over the last uh, 30 years, but still 
not enough to succeed. And one of the explications uh, why um, this uh, enormous ambition did not um, achieve uh, its aims uh, properly is, of course, that so many other imminent crises have um, taken away public attention from the issue of uh, climate change. That has always been the case during the Iraq war, during the Libyan war, uh, during COVID-19 uh, and many, many other uh, crises. Personally, for me, the most challenging uh, crisis of them all were the refugee crisis um, and the euro crisis in 2015. The refugee crisis, because it had uh, two different aspects. One was the humanitarian imperative that we have omitted after the um, extremely cruel and unhuman civil war. Uh, Mr. Assad in Syria, with Russian support, has led against uh, his own people and uh, opposition. We had seen uh, about 10 million refugees in that area without any perspective, without work permission in Turkey, uh, Lebanon or Jordania, without uh, medical protection, without uh, schooling and education for the children. And the question was how to deal with that. Uh, and I uh, recall uh, uh, the situation in uh, summer uh, 2015, when every day for almost half a year, more than 7,000 people knocked on the European door coming via Turkey to Europe, and most of them wanted to stay in Germany, and they did, by the way, actually. And we were challenged to find ways in coping with that on a domestic level first. That means providing humanitarian support, uh, providing schooling, providing uh, food, uh, et cetera. But then, of course, uh, also on the European and international level, uh, and I remember that the um, um, EU-Turkey agreement that was brokered also by Germany and supported from the beginning was all but popular in Germany uh, because we decided to uh, to help the Turkey to 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 provide humanitarian aid uh, to its Syrian, Iraqi, and Afghan refugees on its territory, but it worked, and we were able to uh, to build an international structure that is working still today. One of the very few institutional arrangements with good ref effect for both the humans concerned and the stability of Europe and NATO on the other side. So I think we can learn from that for the future that solutions to international, uh, to international challenges, may it be refugees, may it be climate, uh, may it be other challenges, have to be international. We have we have no chance in dealing with that in a unilateral way. Robin Alexander, a political journalist who covered the Merkel era very extensively, described her style of crisis leadership as radically reactive. The Chancellor herself is once reported to have used the phrase Aufsichtfahren, which is one of those German expressions that doesn't really slot into English, but means something like to proceed cautiously and with great attention to the danger signs immediately in front of you. How would you describe it? And what kind of leadership do you think the German public wants from a chancellor in a time of crisis? The, the image uh, and the meaning of the notion of chancellor has been largely defined by Otto von Bismarck in the 19th century. And it is seen as a success model. Um, we have uh, been lucky enough in Germany, in post for Germany, to see strong chancellors like Konrad Adenauer, uh, Helmut Schmidt, uh, Helmut Kohl, Gerhard Schröder, and uh, Angela Merkel. But as a matter of fact, we have to realize, we have to realize that whoever uh, is going to be a chancellor in, in, the, in the future and whoever has been a chancellor in the past, has no free margin of maneuver to decide on the politics he or she would like to implement. Uh, so many things have been decided already by the predecessors. Uh, others have to be discussed with coalition partners. We have, as long as we are, and we have always been, I think it's for the sake of the country, as long as we are so closely connected to the world economy and to the globalized world, then we have to be reactive. 
a government who is not listening and looking to the challenges coming from abroad, from other countries, from other regions, from other developments, but just sticking to its political party program and uh, neglecting all the other issues would not uh, would not be in a position to develop a successful domestic European or international policy. That is my personal, very profound uh, conviction, and it has been confirmed many, many times over the 30 years I have been in politics and the 20 years I had the honor to, to be part of Angela Merkel's team in different uh, political functions. This is uh, something we have to dare telling our people. And given what you said about sort of reactive politics, the idea that you have to sometimes abandon your political program in order to deal with crises um, and do it swiftly, do you sometimes feel that some strategic mistakes were made in the process? Um, and isn't it also an issue that when you're so preoccupied with kind of crisis management, um, that those kind of strategic problems, long-term things, such as ener energy dependency on Russia, uh, get neglected in the process. So in that, in that balancing act, are there any decisions that you, that you now regret were, were made at the time? Well, first of all, as long as uh, politicians have been in power since the end of the Stone Age, with the emergence of the first cities and states, everybody who took decision has been has been in danger of making mistakes. That is something you cannot exclude because you you have to you have to take your decision on the basis of assumptions with regard to the future. Uh, and that is of course something that that implies errors and that implies mistakes. And therefore if we want to be fair uh, and objective, then I think we have to compare each government with the uh, previous governments of that country and each government with uh, the uh, neighboring governments in other countries in Europe, uh, elsewhere uh, in the world. And then you have, and then you can say, oh, well, uh, compared to others, it was worse or it was better. And it's not my role or not my duty to say how good or how bad we have been. The second point is that um, in Germany, we have had a, a decades-long debate on the role of the military in a democratic state. After the, the, the terrible war that was, that was started by Adolf Hitler and that has devastated large parts of Europe and entire Germany, there was a so-called peace movement from the, uh, from the beginning of the 50s against, against militarization of Germany, as I have called it, against the, an army with the NATO, against membership with NATO. And this is an indication that something went wrong in Germany, because no one of our neighbors was in similar trouble and was so much struggling with the idea whether it is okay to defend yourself and whether it is okay to have the necessary weapons to deliver. I remember when I was uh, when I was uh, asked by Angela Merkel and Horst Seehofer, the then party chairman of CSU, to draft the election manifesto in 2017, I included a, a chapter where I said, "Well, we will stick if re-elected to the uh, two percent target of NATO for defense uh, expenditure." And when you look back, this was uh, criticized by almost all other political parties except the liberals. It was criticized by social democrats, by the Lincoln, by the Green Party, as militarization of uh, Germany. It was a point that um, Germany has decided under the government of Gerhard Schröder and Joschka Pischer from the Green Party to uh, shut down all the nuclear power plants. That was 20 years ago. Then when Angela Merkel was chancellor, we have revised that decision shortly before the nuclear incident of Fukushima. And then 85% uh, of the German population were explicitly against nuclear energy. And then the German uh, parliament took a decision by almost unanimity to make, to revise the, the prolonged activities of nuclear power plants to shoot them down as originally envisaged even one year, one, one year 
earlier. And today we realize this was a German Sonderweg. And I always have argued in my political life and career that the Sonderwege normally the wrong answer to real challenges. I was a little bit, a little bit sad when I, when I have seen in the, in the COP conference, the COP conference in recent days that the United States and 30 other countries have established an alliance to revive nuclear power across Europe and across the globe to better protect the climate. Germany has managed to organize with the help of others an alliance to triple, to triple renewable energies. But um, I think given the um, size of the problem to protect the climate, wouldn't it have been better to say, let's come together and let's say tripling renewable energies and extending and preserving nuclear energy as long as it is needed to reduce the CO2 emissions around the globe. So sometimes, sometimes we need a cross-party consensus, as Americans say, bipartisan consensus. And this is, this is a challenge that we always tried to meet in the past during the refugee crisis, during the Euro crisis when it was about social reforms in Germany. And my impression is that we have, after the Russian aggression against Ukraine, we have a little bit forgotten how to broker compromises that uh, will bring us a decisive step forward and will increase the chance uh, of success. We only have a couple of minutes remaining, but I would like to ask... A final question, quickly, that involves a bit of a change of gears. Over the past few years, we've seen a number of present and former political leaders begin to speak more openly about the toll that responsibility for managing crises has taken on their lives. How does it affect you? First of all, I think I've never been, fortunately, and it was not my merit, never been in a serious health crisis in all these challenging years. In 2019, when we negotiated the transit of Russian gas through Ukraine in the interest of Ukraine and on the demand of Ukraine in my ministry in Berlin, I suffered from a blood infection and didn't know. So I managed to, to conclude the negotiations. And then the doctors in charity told me how dangerous this has been for my health. At the end of um, our time in government, I must admit, I was not, my health was not affected, but I felt a little bit tired. I felt a little bit tired because even the politician from time to time need, need a day off or a holiday. And this is, in most of the cases, not possible because the crisis does not respect your personal holiday calendar. Thank you to everyone who has joined us for this new series of The New Germany. Over the next few weeks, we will turn to political extremism, the country's social transformation, the present and future of the German industry and relations with France and the United States. In the meantime, please write to us with your questions, reflections and vitriol on the social uh, media network formerly known as Twitter, assuming the whole thing hasn't imploded by the time this episode comes out. We are at Hoyer underscore Cat and at Oliver N. Moody. I just can't bring myself to call it X. It just sounds like a teenage boy's dream of a a social media app. That's because it practically is. (laughs) (laughs) And above all, we would like to thank our friends at the Kerberstiftung, whose history and politics podcast, of which this is a part, has a whole Aladdin's cave of other episodes available in both English and German and whose publications on everything from artificial intelligence regulations to the health of democracy can be found at www.koerber-stiftung.de Until next time from Norfolk. And lebt wohl aus Berlin. See you soon.